and it required a lot of uh, iterations to be done but all of this was done by our users on the field and then we sort of captured what they did what uh, 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 features emerge in the engineering design based on what modifications they have done and then we again engineered our uh, machines like this and um, so before I sort of wind up and uh, go on to any uh, questions and answers you may have a couple of uh, uh, things very often when we start uh, trying to build a product particularly for India rural India etc there is this dilemma should I build something that is low cost or should I build something that is world class with all features and everything and uh, I have found that this is often a um, uh, false dilemma uh, the dilemma happens because we pose the question wrongly there is actually nothing called world class there is good quality specific to the target market that we are looking at but there is nothing called a world class quality which is across all domains and across all geographies uh, so whenever we are trying to develop a market for a new product we have to actually see what is it that that customer values and anything that that customer is not going to value we should have the self confidence to throw it out of the window not hold on to it simply because that is generally regarded as good quality so to just give you an instance of that, when we started the working on the ATM, people said, okay, so what will be your dispensation speed? Like a Formula One race, that was the almost the single criterion on which people judged how good an ATM was. Will you do two notes per second or three notes per second? Do you know last month somebody launched something with six notes per second? But we found that for our target market, it hardly matters how many pieces of currency every second I deliver. Uh, if I were to ask my customer, what is your definition of a good quality ATM, then she would say that I must get my money irrespective of whether there's power or not. So that is the quality criterion that we held as central to our design and built the entire ATM around that. Similarly, when we embarked on trying to uh, spin cotton yarn, again people said it's very complex, it's very sophisticated, do you know the standards of uh, yarn making are very high, it's not like you can do any uh, crude thing and get away. And I said, okay, tell me what is good quality yarn. And people said, the strength, the fineness, the uniformity, all of these had to be very exacting. And um, uh, since I and my associates were new to this domain, we tried to make sense of it. And uh, somehow the criteria didn't seem to make sense. And I asked them, supposing I were to take fine steel wires and weave them into a shirt, will you say this is the best shirt that can be made? And obviously it's going to be terribly uncomfortable to wear it and uh, they didn't have an answer and uh, so immediately it was obvious to me that whatever they meant by quality was very different from what I understand as quality. When I say good quality, I mean what is nice to wear, what a customer wants to buy. But when they said quality, they were not meaning that, they were meaning something else. And when I investigated a little more how these criteria came to dominate the textile industry, I found that actually all of these quality criteria have to do with productivity of the machines. When you spin, when you weave, when you dye, when you do various operations with it, you don't want the yarn breaking because it's a nuisance. And therefore you want things to be very strong and very uniform and things like that. So when they say something is better quality, what they mean is you get better productivity. But it doesn't mean you get a better product. So there's a fundamental uh, you know, uh, difference in perception. So the, the uh, nice reason, the nice things about a textile which makes somebody wants to buy it, wear it, are, uh, you know, the, what is called the feel, the handle, the drape, the fall, all these kind of things of the textile. And uh, these are not captured in these quality parameters. So I just ignored them. If you today take our yarn to any laboratory, it will fail every quality test. But the textiles that we have uh, made and we have sold, we have built a brand around it called Malka. Uh, these have been endorsed by the top designers in India and uh, abroad as being uh, the best cotton fabric they have ever seen. So there is this fundamental difference in the understanding of quality, which we should have the courage to question and throw. Um, I'm sorry. So uh, last couple of slides. Um, there is uh, this whole thing about skill gap. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. When I was in school, I had a lot of lessons where I had to memorize and write answers in exams about the population problem, how it's causing um, threat to India's continued existence. 
And by the time I had come out of college, people were talking about demographic dividend. They were both talking about the same thing, but they were talking in a different uh, um, tone. And I didn't know what had changed. Uh, the fact of the matter is that India is probably the uh, one of the youngest countries in the world. It is the youngest country. The average age of an Indian is younger than any other country in the world. And it is going to remain so for many more years to come. Which means that we will have the most number of people in the productive age group. Uh, and in most other countries, people will be either too young to work or too old to work. And therefore, in the next couple of decades, India is going to dominate the world. That's the meaning of demographic dividend. At the same time, it's a fact that most of these people who are entering the working age group have no employable skills. And you're going to have the largest number of aspiring but uh, unemployed uh, people who will be hungry and taken to the streets and you are going to uh, cease to exist as a society. So there, are, there is this bifurcation, so to speak. You will either go on to dominate the world or you will self-destruct. And uh, the chasm between the two is what is called the skill gap. If only you could give this large number of people employable skills in very short span of time, at very low cost, then you take the high road or you go down to perdition. And when we started looking at this, how to do this, we found that there were many important bottlenecks. You can't produce 100 times more teachers than you have, trainers than you have. You can't build so many workshops in such a short time. You can't afford the kind of consumables cost. And when we took at, say, one skill, which almost everybody I meet, I am from the uh, mechanical engineering industry, everybody keeps telling me that, no, there's a shortage of welders. So we took that as a sample and went around and uh, what you see on the left is pretty much the picture of how a welder works. It also could be a picture of how a person learns when he goes to learn welding. Uh, and typically in a two month, which means eight week course, every week only the cost of consumables is 6,000 rupees per week per student. And uh, duration of training is very long, cost of training is very long, this is simply not scalable. So we thought why don't we think of some virtual simulation kind of platforms. Uh, do any of these exist? We can do that as a quick way of learning. And uh, when we investigated, we found that there were a few manufacturers globally, somebody in France, somebody in US, who make virtual 3D reality and everything. You can see those pictures there. But they cost anywhere between 40 lakh to 2 crore. Uh, it's again way too expensive. So they build what they think is very good quality. There is 3D, there is sensors to track how I'm moving my head accordingly. The Images will change, all sorts of things, very sophisticated. Um, but we said we don't need all that. It's irrelevant to our solution. And by uh, focusing on what is it, what is really the problem and what are the things to be solved in order to get there, we examined what is the learning pace. When people come, different people have different learning paces. So a two-month course need not be a two-month course, except that you don't want to fail anybody. So you a little bit lower the standard and extend the duration of the course so everybody passes in two months. Uh, so we did all this kind of mapping. What is the learning curve? What are the kind of skills? There are different kinds of welding, but there are certain skills that are common across all of them, which are actually the most difficult to learn and take the most time. And once they have mastered that, the other incremental skills for variants of it are easily picked up. And we captured all of that into a block of skills called basic skills and mapped it onto a very simple touchscreen based thing with a real looking welding gun. It's actually a real welding gun, but the inside things have been changed. Instead of all the conventional components that go inside a welding gun, we put some sensors and other things. So if I hold it against it, then I'll have a realistic rendering of uh, the welding in terms of the visuals I see and the sounds. And after I finish my welding, it will tell me what I did right, what I did wrong, what I need to improve, all of those things. And by playing it like a video game, at my own pace, I can actually uh, become an employable welder with just a finishing school kind of exposure of two, three days at the end of it. If I score so many points in a video game, after that I just need to go to school for three days, then I get a job. And uh, lastly, there's this, uh, I find that you know, with the present generation, everybody says, okay, I'm going to start up, I need venture capital where I can get an angel funder or something. So these are some statistics to just say that that's not the way to uh, think about a venture, we have to actually think about the customer. We are always thinking about two-minute elevator pitch so that we can, you know, 
con somebody into parting with some money. Getting that kind of money is like junk food. It's very nice and very tempting, but in the long run, not good for health. Uh, it will be much better if we think of the customer rather than think of an investor. And uh, actually, we can get the customer to invest. We can be creative about it. We can tell somebody, you give me some advance, and uh, I will give you after two months, etc., etc. So these are just some statistics to put that in perspective. And uh, lastly, this is the summary. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, if you feel strongly, urge, a strong enough urge to go out there and start doing something, go ahead. And you can learn everything on the way. Thank you. question, you know, when you were showing the ATM timelines, and I think this is something that you've probably seen in all of the other products you've done. It takes a long time to get the product right, even though the core engineering problem is solved very early on. Um, and that's sometimes very uh, detrimental to running a business in some sense, the iteration that you spoke about. So what have been your learnings about how you can speed up the process of invention, get a product into the market quickly, which will start making money for you? Yeah, actually, it's a good question. I don't. I will not even claim that I have solved the uh, problem. It remains a problem. But what we can actually, if we are mindful of this challenge that you pointed out, what we can do is avoid spending time on many things which the customer does not want to pay for. Which is what I had indicated in terms of you know being clear about the quality criterion that is valued by our customers. So if we know that this is what this person wants, we can probably avoid a lot of things. And also by staying, uh, by keeping our ear close to the customers whom we want to target, uh, we will know early on what are the things that remain to be done. We don't have to be taken by surprise. At least with me, what has happened is I would assume that something is now ready, I'm going to um, uh, set the market on fire and then I find that there are some important requirements which I didn't know of but unless that is there the market will not even take it and this is actually this uh, disconnect between the designer and actually the uh, customer and we have to bridge that by being constantly in conversation with the end user so that we know that we don't miss out anything that is important but we don't also waste effort on things that are not important to the customer. Hi, yeah. um, here. Yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, this: uh, the ATM machine again, continuing on the ATM machine. I myself seen it in Research Park. It looks uh, really nice, and it sounds like a very good invention. I just want to know why uh, you said that we you're doing about 700 in numbers. Is there a big stumbling block? Because I mean, the other ATM companies, the the market leaders are like what 20,000, 30,000 ATMs already, and uh, the the problem it solves is is a problem all over India now. I mean, Coimbatore is getting 12-hour power cuts, Trichy is getting 14-hour power cuts. Um, yeah, it's not that we are doing 700 per annum. We only hit the market in 2009 with a very small number, uh, barely two-digit kind of numbers. And uh, essentially, over the last one to two years is when we have slowly ramped up. And uh, this year, we expect to have about 3,000 more added to it. And it would ramp up like that. That's how a product company is. There's a long uh, phase when you are in development, and then you would start ramping up. And just to see it in perspective, whatever 20, 30,000 numbers that a conventional player would have is something that they have built over the last, uh, say, three decades or so. Um, but what has happened is that we put about 500 numbers by creating this category called rural. Till then, there was nothing called a rural ATM. And it is we who are uh, sort of um, putting that name and making it understood in banking circles. And when the first 500 or so went into different rural areas, etc., then it got kind of assumed that, yes, there is a separate category called rural ATM and separate category called urban ATM.